Welcome uh, to our next session for uh, AEC 270, Heavy Methods of Construction. In the last lecture, we had talked about um, coefficient of traction, and before that, we had talked about the uniform, the unified, I'm sorry, classifica soil classification system, unified soil classification system. And um, I wanted to show you how we use that in construction in particular how that information can be used by you, the contractor, to assist in building the structure. And uh, basically, we, um, when a building is proposed and it has a foundation, and all buildings have foundations to pass loads uh, that are uh, being borne onto the building, the people inside, and the wind blowing, and the snow flying, and everything else, um, they will commission, the owner will commission a geotechnical report, and the geotechnical report is used first by the designer, but it's used uh, second by uh, by you as the contractor, and it's normally included as part of the contract documents. And so in this particular case, we have a very simple uh, project to look at. It's a proposed storage shed up in Elk River, Minnesota. It's performed by Chosen Valley mm -hmm. Testing, and they're a, a reasonable um, geotechnical mm -hmm. engineering uh, uh, outfit, and in fact, they're very reasonable, they're good people. In this uh, particular case, you can see that like all, like the design, this is executed by a licensed professional engineer, in this case, Colby Verdian. In, in this particular case, we've, uh, he's, he's been commissioned to look at a structure. And he's going to do several things when, uh, when he does that, and you'll see in the report. There's generally an introduction. What was the purpose of the study? What was the scope? What was done? And then most importantly, where were the borings and soil samples taken? And what is the local soil and bedrock and everything else geology? The reason that we take borings is so that we can look and see what the soil is without having to open the, uh, the site. Of course, we could just imagine that the soil is is always made up of clay, they're always made up of gravel, and then we could just figure out what the costs are as we're going along and constructing it. But that's not a good situation because if when we do that, we end up with the cost overruns. And so what we want to do is we want to know what it is the soil, what soils are we going to encounter, and that's going to tell us what work has to be done. And that's from the designer's point of view. But as the contractor, you also have an interest. You have an interest in knowing a few things about the site while you're bidding. And that is the subsurface data. And so section B of this report takes the borings, the samples that were taken through the thickness of the soil. It tells us about the layers or strata, the stratification of the soil, about the penetration testing of the soil, of which we'll say more, and the laboratory test results to tell us how stiff or how strong the soil is and what that soil is made of. And then groundwater data, which tells you whether or not there may be groundwater at an elevation through which you want to dig. And if there is, it tells you you may have to be dewatering the site. If there's evidence of it having been in the past, that may tell you that so one of the, the provisions you need in your contract is you may have to dewater, drag the local ground table, groundwater table down below so that you can work without having to have scuba gear on. It then provides design data. It looks at the analysis and recommendations, again, going towards the contractor, or rather designer, but also some information there will be useful for the contractor. And then it makes recommendations about construction. And so all of these inf pieces of information which are commissioned by the owner, supplied to you, the, design, uh, the contractor, as part of the contract documents, has information that you're going to want. So having talked about all of that, we're going to work on the appendix first. And let's take a look and see what our appendix looks like. And here are the documents that we have in our appendix. We have the location sketch. We have a log of the four borings that were taken. And then some information that talks to us about the description of the soil. So let's take a look. This, uh, this is a photograph, it's a satellite photograph, probably from Google Earth, that shows the footprint of the proposed building. 
And so that white line, that box is the proposed, this is where we're going to put this storage shed. And then there's four borehole locations, borehole number one, two, three, and four. And those four boreholes are advanced and um, as they, and they go through the soil, drilling down, and we take samples of the soil in various manners. And those samples are used to evaluate what material is present. And we get a standard borehole log, and there's always variations in them. And this is, uh, this is what a standard borehole log looks like. There's several pieces of information to see here. One is, this is boring number one. So if we go back to the drawing, we can find out where this boring is placed. Here is the elevation. The, the existing ground is assigned an elevation of 100. One foot two or 98.8. This is 6.5 feet below the, uh, the surface or three or 93.5. And this is 14.9 feet below the surface, 85.1. And so this is giving you elevation, and this is giving you the depth. At that point, as you encounter each type of soil, the type of soil will be identified using that unified soil classification system. So the first 1.2 feet is sand poorly graded. From 1.2 or thereabouts, down to 6.5 feet, we have a silt that of medium plus, or sorry, a sand of medium plasticity. And so that is a silty sand, and it has, uh, it has some uh, plasticity, which we'll talk about in a second. From six foot five to the end of the boring, there is fine to medium grained silty clay sand, so sand with silt and clay in it. It's gravel, a little bit, trace, right? It's a few particles of gravel. It's gray, it's wet, and it's loose. So let's take a look what other information is present on here. BPF is what we call the end number, the standard penetration number, or the blows per foot. And so this is how resistant the soil is to driving a hammer, or a nail rather, into the soil with a standard hammer, standard penetration hammer. Um, these numbers can be very wide ranging, but a zero means that the weight of the nail itself was enough to bury it. In other words, you put the, the nail in the soil and it flew, fell into the soil. That soil is not very stiff. I checked it again here, founding, finding the soil to be not very stiff. This is, the, uh, this is the silty clay, and you'll notice it's identified as glacial till. So glacial uh, deposits and, uh, glaci and glaciation, it's very important for us working locally to know how the soil was in place. This glacial till Till is, is an unsorted or unclassified material that's dropped by the glacier. It's usually relatively, uh, relatively stiff, and you can see instead of zero, we have six, seven, nine, and seven blows per foot, which is not super exciting, but it's not the end of the, of the, end of the world anyway. So this tells you that these two, uh, this soil layer here is not compacted at all. It probably has almost no capacity for, for for carrying, and if we look at it, it's been identified as fill. In other words, this glacial till material is deposited by the glacier, but sometime after glaciation, some people, we don't know who, we don't care who, put in some fill. That may have been uh, outwashed from, a, or that may have been a, um, a spoil from a, another hole that was dug somewhere else, or the material that's left over is spread somewhere. It may have been, uh, uh, something taken out of, uh, of somewhere else and, uh, and deposited on the site. In any case, we don't like fill. Unless we've seen the fill compacted and in place, we're going to want not to be dealing with fill. This column and this symbol in particular, a triangle with a couple of lines, two or three below it, 
tells you where the groundwater was at the time of investigation. You'll notice that it describes this, the uh, glacial till as wet and loose, that it describes the fil silty sand here, this fill, as loose and wet. Right, it doesn't describe it as loose, only describes it as wet. And that's because the local water table is down at an elevation of, and these are scale drawings, so you can, uh, you can scale across them. If we take that elevation, let me put it there, it looks like about uh, uh, at a distance of, oh, um, 1.6 feet or thereabouts there will be water encountered in an excavation. If you try to dig a 10-foot hole, 10-foot deep hole, you will find out that the water will show up. It will fill your excavation. And so if you want to, uh, want to continue digging in that area, you'll have to dewater. The other piece of information that we find over here is our uh, moisture contents. 18.7%, 10.1%, 13.4%. So the samples that have been taken, some of them are, are taken, they're weighed, they're put in the oven, they're weighed again, and the weight of water expresses a percentage of the dry mass is given to you. It tells you that uh, silty clay sand at a 13.4 um, moisture content is going to be a not the most pleasant material in the world to deal with. So let's take a look at boring number two. Boring number two is more complicated. Boring number two, again, it advanced 14.9 feet. And uh, they encountered the, uh, the water level in this case. They encountered it at, uh, at about five feet below the surface. And it, uh, you can see the moisture content changes from 10.6. Here's this glacial till layer again. And this glacial till layer now is at a, at a depth of, uh, was at uh, 11 and a half feet from the uh, surface. Again, same description. Silt and clay mixed together with sand, a trace of gravel, it's gray, it's the same soil layer that occurred between those two. And then we have our layers of fill. You'll notice here our fill has a trace of brick, right? Brick, manufactured brick made by humans. So that's a relatively new deposit. We have a silty sand, a silt, and another silty sand, which are identified by brown, gray, gray. This one has a trace of gravel in it. But these are glacial fluvium. That's always nice to uh, remember why uh, some people take Latin in high school, including yours truly. Glacial means it's placed by the glacier. Fluvium is flowing water. So there was at one time an outwash. So the, the water from the melting ice combined with particles inside the glacier deposited these glacial flu fluvium materials. And um, you can see the blow counts are up. Uh, we've got a uh, much higher blow count in this fill, but we still don't like fill. In fact, the law of fill, it's not mine, it's Hector Jake's, is that if you don't see the fill get put in, then you do see it get taken out. You can't rely on this uh, fill the same way you could on, say, a nature naturally deposited soil. Let's take a look at boring number three. Okay, boring number three. Here we have a foot of that fill. And then we have five and a half, or four, yeah, five and a half feet or thereabouts of what might be fill. And this is the geotechnical engineer using his or her judgment. It doesn't look like fill in that we didn't find any broken brick or anything else obvious in it, or cinders. But it might not be naturally deposited soil. It's got a blow count of four, coming up to a blow count of seven, doesn't look particularly exciting. Again, our water level is uh, sitting at an elevation uh, just uh, under two feet. So uh, if you dig a hole deeper than two feet, you can expect that hole to fill with water. This is our glacial till again, fine to medium grained, silty, silty clay sand with a little bit of gravel 
and it's gray, it's wet, very loose to medium dense. Look, as it gets down here, these blow counts are starting to get higher, right? So here we have very, you know, loose, four to seven, very loose, five, six, medium dense, 11, 15. So as the number of blows it takes to drive our, our, um, our nail or our sampler in 10 feet, or sorry, one foot, 15 blows per foot as opposed to four blows per foot as opposed to zero in boring number one. It's telling us information about how strong that soil is, but also how easy it's going to be to remove if we have to remove it. Uh, the, the same thing will work if you have a hydraulic excavator. If it goes to pick up blow count zero soil, that's loose. It'll come out very easily. If it tries to remove blow count, blow count 30 soil, it's going to take a lot more work, and so we're going to need to know what that digging efficiency is. So we'll need to read these geotechnical reports. Finally, we're boring four. Same type of information. We have six and a half feet of fill. Then we have a glacial till. That is a silty clay sand with a trace of gravel. A clay sand, which means that some of our silt is coming away. A sandy lean clay which is more clay than sand, and you can see it's, uh, it, is, uh, it is loose. This is described as rather stiff at this location. So 10, 9 are getting, uh, those numbers are getting up there. Um, this gives you a lot of information. It also tells you that there's no water table, right? Water was not observed in drilling. Now these are all relative. You would have to survey in each individual point to be sure of what is going on. And let me see what else have we got. We should have a set of instructions that allow us to read that information that we found in the um, So those are the sorry, those are the test values. That's we looked at the test, and then the report is written to communicate some or all of that information, as the case may be. So let's uh, let's take a look and see what uh, what that uh, what that is. So um, here we have the purpose: we're going to build a garage. The scope: obtain four drawings to a depth of 15 feet. Boring locations and elevations are shown. So the sketch in the appendix of the report shows an approximate boring locations as drilled, plotted by GPS coordinates. And uh, the elevation was arbitrarily at an assigned elevation of 100 feet because the assumption is that the uh, site was graded flat and the ground surface at all boring locations were the same. We don't know that that's the case, but uh, you, we, you and I haven't been out to the site. The geological background is that um, we can read and see what it uh, see what has gone on. To the I mean, here we would look at historical records, look at uh, subsurface geology maps, and as you can see in this case, the owner graded the site prior to construction. So we have the origin of our fill. We don't know the depth of the fill. We don't have any uh, documentation of compaction. Satellite photos indicate a long shed was constructed over the east part of the site in the past. Geologic maps indicate that the natural soils in the area are dominated by various glacial deposits. Bedrock is more than 50 feet below the surface, so it may as well, be, it may as well not be there. And then what, they have, uh, what they've done for us is they look at our stratification. And here they've plotted the borings going from east to west. This um, cross-hatched material here is the fill, and you can see the fill's pretty uniform. Looks like a fairly uniform fill site. There's a silty sand that is present at uh, boring two, but not at the other two borings. You have this um, silty clay sand, which is a glacial till, which we encounter here. There's a layer of silt, which could have been a small uh, river or something else running on the surface of the till deposit. But this tells you something about the uh, stratification of the layers that are present in the soil. So if you have to dig, um, if you want to take all of the fill out, you have to dig 
to a depth of about six and a half feet to remove all of that fill. That tells you, if you knew the square area of the, of the footprint of the building and a reasonable taper, you could calculate how much soil that is. And we'll talk about how to do that in our, uh, one of our next talks. It also tells you how to interpret some of the information. B2 talks about penetration resistance, penetration test, laboratory test results. Tells us that the N values or the penetration blows are zero to seven blows per foot were recorded in the fill and possible fill soils. They are not very compact. Natural soils range from five to 15 blows per foot indicating loose to medium density. A, uh, a key to descriptors used to qualify the relative density of soil can be found in the legend um, found in the appendix, and I don't know that I have a copy of that, but I will present others to you as we go along. Groundwater data. Water was observed in borings B1, a depth of two to five feet. In the north central boring before, the soils were clays or more clayey at depth, and, it is li and that likely prevented water from collecting in the borehole. So even though that water isn't there, it says that uh, it goes on to say that based on the soil coloration, we suspect water would have risen to about five feet if the borehole had been left open, and that we would expect groundwater levels to fluctuate. Now, here we get some additional information, and it's information that we need. One is that the bearing pressure of the, uh, of the soil, or bearing pressure of the structure, is going to be about 2,000 pounds per square foot. So you can use uh, the maximum equivalent strip footings is 2,530 2, pounds per linear foot. And um, you know, make some design recommendations. He's uh, talking about um, normal construction standards would require removal of fill and replacing it with compacted engineered fill. Our next lecture is going to be about compaction. Any stripping or corrective excavation should be oversized, at least one foot beyond the foundations. And uh, you can reduce that by 50 cent, 50 percent if you precisely stake the location during grading. The site excavation should be dewatered. If this is done, and most of the soil that's on site for fill is acceptable for reuse. It just has to be compacted. Talks about soils immediately below the footing. And it goes on to tell you that the foundation should be designed to exert pressures no greater than 3,000 pounds per square foot. And that's what we call the bearing capacity of the soil. It uh, provides you with a few alternatives as to how things might get done. It, uh, it talks about what should, be, uh, what should be inspected at the time of construction. And it gives you advice. It says the deeper excavations will require, right? There we are. The deeper excavations will require the use of a backhoe. With backhoe with a smooth lip bucket is recommended to limit disturbance of the natural bearing soils. Excavation of any significant depth are expected to encounter water, which would be moved before filling and we had our discussion, right? The sidewalls of the excavation will need to be sloped to meet OSHA requirements, and soils which are not dewatered will likely collapse even at rather flat back slopes. That's information that's useful to you as the contractor. That tells you that you're going to need a trench box for deep excavations, or better, you are going to uh, want to avoid the deep excavations if you don't dewater because they will continue to collapse even at very tapered slope tells you it's in Minnesota, so make sure you uh, don't have any frost in the soil when you're building. And then you should uh, have the geotechnical engineer come out, or a geotechnical engineer come out and evaluate the boring surfaces, the soils that, bear, that, that loads are going to be bearing upon, such that you make sure that you are, in, um, you are on the right strata of soil. Okay. Level of care, geotechnical engineers always have this on here that, you know, in between the borings, it's quite possible. In fact, it's, uh, it's almost a guarantee that the soil will, will drift separately. 
And I don't think, I'm just going to take here a second, I don't think we got our, um, I don't think we got our um, data sheet. But I'll find you another data sheet and I'll add that on as, a, uh, as an additional lecture. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what we get out of borings. And again, the information that's present from the geotactical boring is the soil type identified by an expert, the N number, or the blow count, which tells you how stiff, how compacted the soil is, the water table, location, and they even made recommendations about the equipment to be used. So that helps us out a lot if we are the contractor much more than just what's in the design. The geotechnical engineer is an engineer who's a specialist in soil. So usually they've got a pretty good idea of what's going on with soil. So um, what, we'll, uh, what we'll do is have an assignment up uh, uh, in the next day or so. In that assignment, we'll be uh, having you uh, read and then, um, and then provide some comments uh, from the reading of, uh, of uh, a geotechnical report and then uh, we are going to uh, re-emphasize uh, the transfer of, of uh, flywheel horsepower uh, into uh, tractive power and uh, start talking about individual pieces of equipment. As always, if there's any problems with the class, either call me, which I'm glad to hear from you, or email me. It's McDonald K at UW Stout. Edu is like forgetting your own phone number, and uh, I will be glad to get back to you. All right, take care. Till next time.